K-Mini Foster Reef, Yana Pakirvanak, and a very warm welcome to MCMR in celebration of St. Bridget's Day 2021. My name is Ronan Gargan, the Ambassador of Ireland to Hungary, and I'm delighted to present this year's celebration. On Law of Ailer Bridge, we celebrate the life of St. Bridget, and in doing so, celebrate the creativity and contribution of women everywhere in the world. It is also a moment to resolve on this day to remember our shared commitment to equality and universal respect for rights as we strive to build a more just world for everyone, male and female. This year, the Embassy of Ireland in Hungary is delighted to partner with the Contemporary Music Centre to present tonight's CMC Salon and CMC Spotlight in celebration of the creative talent of Irish and Hungarian women in contemporary music. This is the fourth anniversary of the Department of Foreign Affairs celebrations worldwide for St. Bridget's Day and it's the second year that the Embassy of Ireland in Hungary has marked this special day. We begin this evening with a special CMC Salon for St. Bridget's Day, with performances of works by Irish and Hungarian composers, along with discussions about the music with the composers and the performers. An amazing example of international collaboration and artistic spirit, the CMC has this evening facilitated new, creative partnerships between Irish and Hungarian artists in contemporary music. The Embassy is very happy that these strong, creative connections will be celebrated further when we come to celebrate Bloom's Day in June 2021, in partnership again with the, committee, with the CMC as well as with the Budapest Music Centre. But for now, it gives me great pleasure to pass on the musical baton to CMC Director Yvonne Ferguson with music and conversation for the next 45 minutes in the CMC St. Bridges Day Salon. A warm welcome to the CMC Salon, the first CMC Salon of 2021. On this, the first day of February, the feast day of St. Bridget, La Fela Bridge and in bulk. In Ireland, the 1st of February is the official beginning of spring. And we have the great pleasure of working with the ambassador and the team at the Embassy of Ireland in Hungary to bring you this evening's Salon and Spotlight events to celebrate the creativity of women active in contemporary music, both in Ireland and in Hungary. And so your stet to all our Hungarian friends in music. Our salon this evening features two new works for guitar from CMC emerging composer Anya Malin and Hungarian composer Petra Sassi. Both works written in response to St. Bridget's Day and the first day of spring, written for and performed by guitarist Kathleen Kultai. Hello to Anya and to Kathleen joining us from their homes in the UK and Petra will join us a little bit later on as well to talk about her work and we feature Three movements from Gronje Mulvey's seminal work for soprano and guitar, a Carlo song cycle based on poetry by Derek Coyle and performed for us this evening by Elizabeth Hilliard soprano and Anselm MacDonald guitar. A big hello to you, Gronje, Elizabeth and Anselm, joining us from your homes across the island of Ireland. And I'm here in the cosy library of 19 Fishamble Street in central Dublin. Well, at this very challenging time across the world, this evening we'll hear music written and recorded during these very unusual times. And we'll hear from all our artists this evening on how they have risen to the challenges of working remotely. It's the first day of spring and as we turn this corner of the year, new ideas, new directions, new horizons and new music. And our first work this evening is a very new work. It's the world premiere of Anya Malin's solace in bulk for solo guitar commissioned by CMC as part of our CMC Emerging Composers program. Anya, this is a work that's uh, a response to the day that's in it, the first day of spring and in bulk as our ancestors called it. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I was really fascinated when I, I found out um, there are sort of all of these passage tunes across Ireland um, and of course uh, probably well probably the, the most famous is Newgrange um, but this particular one the Mound of Hostages which is located on the Hill of Tara is actually aligned with the sun so that on the morning of Imbolc um, the the chamber within the passage tomb is filled with light uh, which illuminates uh, lots of Neolithic carvings all along the walls of the tomb um, and I thought that was 
such a unique uh, and interesting uh, concept. So I sort of tried to translate that into sound. Uh, and so that's what my piece is based on for, uh, for guitar. Kathleen, this work was written for you and yourself and Anya uh, got together remotely, of course, which is the, the only way at the moment, unfortunately. And um, this is your first work for guitar, if I'm if I'm right, Anya. So um, a very new experience for you. And we'll talk to Gronya later as well about about writing for guitar. Kathleen, this this work, uh, I know you, you were telling me that you found it very beautiful and you're, you're really happy uh, to be learning it and to have worked with Anya. But the challenge of working remotely for the both of you um, over the last month or so to in, in collaborating on this work, how has that been, Kathleen? Well, I think it, it worked really well, to be honest. Um, um, but I, I suppose it was really challenging for Anya because I asked her to write this piece for not a standard classical guitar. So as a, as a first work, she had to... Well, actually, this is the very first piece written for a new guitar, um, um, which is the testing model is here. Um, so I don't know if you can see that the fretboard is transformed yes. and uh, you have these small magnet capos, which can if you see here and um so i put another one another one there so this is a guitar prototype i've been working this is a new guitar prototype i've been working on for uh well the magnet cable system i was working for more than a more than several years now, but the prototype is is brand new and the concert model is not ready yet. Um, and um, I would I, I say this is like the pilot uh, pilot um, project for the mo moment with these two new works that I am still testing the prototype. And Anya was really so dedicated to to this this project, and I. I think she understood very well what is this about, and she she used the affordances of the new guitar extensively in her work. Um, I felt we could really connect spiritually and um, musically very well through even Zoom, or maybe it was just the music that helped us to connect. And. Kathleen, I know you've spoken before about kind of idiomatic writing for the guitar, um, you know, and, and how you're you're drawn to, you know, composers who who think very much about, you know, writing for the instrument and, and the particulars of writing to the instrument. So I'm um, just curious, Anya and Kathleen, the, the wonderful description you gave there of the um, the hill at Tara and how you're trying to create the, the, the images there and the light coming through on the 1st of February. Are there certain elements of guitar writing that we should listen out for when we hear the piece? Mm, um, well, yeah, I, I think one thing that I really tried to incorporate into the piece was this sense of um, expansiveness. So um, I used the uh, capo system um, that Kathleen has developed uh, to try and um, quite literally expand the pitch as the piece continues. Um, so this sort of pitch range starts off smaller um, and uh, there are sort of chord structures throughout the piece that expand and grow uh, to sort of represent the the light coming into coming into the chamber. Fantastic we'll speak a little bit more about it but for now let's hear this very very new work from Anya Malin, Solace in Bulk on this new guitar developed by Kathleen Kultai and this work performed by Kathleen. Thank you. 
Anya Malin's Solace in Bulk performed on guitar by Kathleen Coltai and uh, really interesting to hear about the development of the new guitar Kathleen and this first work for the guitar which we're um, really privileged to have on the CMC Salon this evening on the Feast of St Bridget and uh, great to hear about how successful it was to work um, remotely and that uh, you didn't feel um, inhibited by that and Anya there was something else just that I wanted to to touch on which is this, this wonderful image you have of the light um, and and the and the hill of Tara and you've also um, commissioned an artist to uh, to draw that for your score. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one thing that I, I really uh, love to do actually for, um, I think I've done it for all of my scores so far. Um, it really um, sort of encapsulates the entire concept uh, in, a, in a really visual way. And uh, so I like to, to commission a visual artist um, uh, yeah, the, the visual artist that, that did the artwork for this score and actually has done uh, a lot of artwork for me in the past is called Jasmine Earl. Um, and she's so wonderful. I sort of 
I usually phone her up and just throw loads of things at her, tell her what the piece is about, and she'll send me through a quick draft of what she sees. And um, it usually really matches up to what I've got in my head. And uh, it's a really interesting process. And uh, I think really helps consolidate the sounds that I've got in my head as well. And sort of really brings it all together, actually. It's really interesting. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing um, more of your scores, future scores with these beautiful uh, graphics and beautiful, beautiful visual elements. Um, I'm going to turn it to, to you, Gronya, because um, we've heard this new work by Anya and uh, guitar repertoire, of course, is very much um, dear to your heart. You've written many pieces for guitar, worked with different guitarists, but of course you, you have played the guitar in the past. So you come to it with uh, a fair amount of knowledge. Um, I wouldn't class myself now as a as a guitarist as such because um it's a, it's I went through a few grades put it that way um and my guitar uh was stolen so that ended my time taking it uh, to a level of serious um uh, contention and um because of that it's really helped really with with anything to do with guitar or whatever just to even have learned a certain amount and just picked up on some techniques etc etc um, and then on my brothers play guitar as well so there's always been guitar has been brought out to sing or whatever else so it was something that was always there in my childhood um, the other level unfortunately didn't last too long but it's good now at least to have um, you know a knowledge so that when you come to it and you write um, you have that experience of the feel of it even though I, I'm not a performer at all, but it's still good to have that experience nonetheless. Yeah, um, and, and kind of the, the flip side of that coin, Anselm, if I could come to you, I mean, you're a composer represented by CMC and a guitarist. So you were coming to Gronya's work with your performer hat on, but of course, also keeping your composer hat on. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I find it, especially when playing a guitar work, difficult to distinguish between the two. And Gronje's work certainly actually uh, cultivates some of those uh, composing skills. There's various parts in some of the movements where uh, the player is uh, given a little box within which to work and has to decide how exactly they're going to perform it. And I, I had some discussion with Gronje about that, but I feel that's a moment where uh, very much I'm figuring out how am I going to, how am I going to compose and how am I going to play through this particular passage because I'm given a certain amount, a certain amount of freedom uh, within which to do so. And I suppose the, the, the interesting part that we have to uh, talk about be before we watch these wonderful recordings by Elizabeth and Anselm is that we are here on the 1st of February and we're in uh, a fairly strict lockdown uh, across the island of Ireland, uh, across the world, of course. And so uh, where Eliz Elizabeth and Anselm should be here with me in the library, uh, performing this work uh, socially distanced from both me and from each other, that wasn't unfortunately able to happen. So we had to do a fairly big rethink after Christmas. And with your great skill and generosity, uh, Liz and Anselm, we have this wonderful recording that you made remotely. Liz in Dublin in her house and Anselm in Belfast in his house. How did you make that happen, Liz? Um, so when I came back from my holidays after Christmas, I was like, how is this going to happen? I'm going to get a call from CMC to cancel the concert. Um, and I was absolutely delighted. I got a call to say, look, we've been looking into Jamulus and audio movers. Are you willing to try it? And I said, well, I'm not great at tech, but Jonathan um, Jonathan Grimes in the, um, the CMC uh, team, he really talked me through the process of how to set up Jamulus on my computer. At this point, I still didn't think it would work, but I was very, very, a very positive person. I was very willing to give it a go. And then I think it was like, Myself and Anselm, we both had a kind of chat on Zoom, said, well, we'll see what happens. We think it's going to work. Let's start it now. I was like, oh my gosh, we can actually hear each other. 
and we're perfectly in sync. So I still don't actually believe it really happened, but um, it was just this wonderful experience. It was the first time doing chamber music with someone in, uh, well, in nearly a year. So um, yeah, thank you so much to CMC for their ambition for this project because so many other performances have still disappeared. So thank you. Oh, I've seen a sneak preview of this video and it's absolutely beautiful. The, the performance uh, that you, the, 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 the chemistry and the rapport between both of you as performers. I, I was uh, really surprised. I mean, it has come really come across in the video, even though you're in two different places. And Anselm, how, I mean, what, talk us through a little bit, you know, more of the setup. I mean, there really was, it was quite involved. Yes, so we were both we were both recording ourselves separately, but hearing each other through Jamulus, um, so online. And I think I think the thing the thing both of us thought would be the uh, I guess the barrier that this wouldn't get over was the latency issue of things being too far apart. Um, so we recorded three of the movements from Gornia's Carlo song cycle, and we started off by working on the one which I guess was the most um, in a way it's kind of antiphonal elizabeth um makes a gesture and then i respond to that and then uh, so there's some crossover but also they're far enough apart that we felt well we can do this no matter how bad the latency is and then we kind of got gradually more towards the more rhythmic movements of the piece and we're astonished by how well they worked and how well we were able to hear each other um yeah, I mean, it, for Liz, in, so, in some of the movements, though, she said, actually, we were we had each other on Zoom as well, but we were on mute. But we actually had to slightly ignore at one point the video because the video was two or three seconds behind the audio. So, you know, I would I would do a big chord, but actually Liz had heard it two or three seconds before. <laughs> I, I'm really, I, I think everyone will be truly amazed when they watch this to how how fine it really comes across the uh, the performance and how it's worked out. And uh, I'm just really delighted that we were able to record these three movements from the Carlo song cycle. Gronya, this cycle, it's from 2018, 2019, and you worked very closely with um, Derek Coyle, who, like you, is based in County Carlo. Um, and um, I suppose it, it, the text is really arresting, the, the poetry and the, the, that everyone will, will hear um, sung by Liz. It's very arresting text. And, you know, Gronya, this, did you, I mean, were the poems already there when you decided to set them? Or did you have much discussion collaboration with Derek on this work? Um, yes, the poems were there. They um, were in the process of being published. So, uh, this is the book that it's come into. It's um, reading John Ashbury in Costa Coffee, Carlo. And it's also published in Sweden. So uh, the publisher Magnus Grin Forlag is uh, responsible for bringing it out. And the one of the actual um, movements that they're doing today, which is the charred boots, is uh, in, in this book and it, one of my favorite pieces of writing. But um, Derek and I, uh, we had a good collaboration. He sent me quite a good few poems across before the, the book had been published. And um, I, I viewed the ones that I wanted to actually focus on. And because it was a 25 minute overall work, I decided we'd take a few of the poems and, and I'd set them so that we'd have five minutes for, for about for six of them. And the tree that we hear tonight, one is, uh, it's, they're all hashtag kind of hashtag numbers because it's in the spirit of John, John Ashbery, the, the poet, the American poet and surrealist poet. Um, so he, he tributes uh, the kind of writing to how surrealist poetry in, in, his, in John Ashbery's work. Um, and uh, the poems, number 17, uh, the first one they start off with, are, it's quite explosive, quite explicit. Um, it's really uh, see personified and just berating us for being such bad hosts <laughs> and destroying it, destroying the coral reef. And it's, it's quite of explosive language, uh, quite a, some expl uh, expletives as well used at the beginning. But um, 
it does conjure up that visceral anger that's there that's palpable um, and the charred boots in comparison is such a gentle poem all about childhood memory um, and there's such beautiful imagery um, uh, like uh, comparing uh, his being rare as being born kind of late to his parents as like a Seville orange in the cold December as such beautiful um, imagery. Um, and so that's so touching. And I thought that's got to be very gentle, very kind of uh, intimate in the way uh, the music is treated. Um, and the last one then, I just took a stanza from one of his poems, it's number 43, and it's just, um, it, it's just snowflakes fell in June, flat, fast and furious, and a nightingale um, came to next to feed from outstretched hand. So I, I haven't got that completely quoted properly, but that's about, that's the text generally. Um, and that's again, with a lot more space. So probably, I don't know, maybe Anselm, that was probably the easier one to, to tackle because of the, the time, you know, that you could pull around where the rest, the other two are, are more intricate. And uh, certainly the one, the charred boots is very much motoric. So, you know, it, it's very much slow, but motoric in, in character. So it has to um, be kind of very much in sync. So that's basically it, but the collaboration was excellent. And um, he works in Carlo, he's in Carlo College. He teaches there, he teaches undergrads. Um, and he has quite a lively um, writers group growing going as well there. So you know, you know, people are invited as well every month to take part, um, and he's very active. And uh, I think really an excellent poet. And I wouldn't have found him were it not for Morgan Buckley, who did commission this, and we we got introduced because of him. So I'd like to thank Morgan for that aspect. And certainly, I'm so thrilled with Anselm and uh, Liz and Anselm. Uh, I couldn't. It, it's just excellent what they've done with the piece. I'm so thrilled. And um, thanks to you, Yvonne, for hosting it under such difficult circumstances, and to the embassy as well. It's, yes. it's just a great opportunity. I'm really thrilled to be here. Yeah. Delighted, Gornia. Um, really delighted to to do so. And of course, we should say that you know yourself and Liz work very closely. Uh, have done so on many collaborative projects. And um, you know, it's it's a real treat always um, to hear Liz perform your work oh. because she has such uh, a strong affinity with it and and yeah. such expertise and knowledge oh. of your vocal repertoire. Mm -hmm. And, and so Liz, you know, they, you, you, there are quite a number of Gronya's works which are solo uh, works uh, for you or for voice and um, electronics, mm -hmm. or voice and tape. And um, I, I'm kind of interested, uh, you know, um, in, as you, as you said, this is the first time that you've been able to have an ensemble uh, experience um, for, for almost a year, but you've used that time so positively and so um, creatively to develop your practice even more. Yeah, um, it's been really interesting for me. I've done a number of collaborations this year. Um, so Gronia and myself have been working for most of last year on a new work called Great Women, which will be coming out this June on the Metagay label. And this is a really fantastic piece uh, Grony has written it's it's celebrating the great women of Irish uh, the Irish um, the rising and the war of independence so it's Rosie Hackett and Count, Countess Markovich and also our first two female presidents so it's really that wide the, the hopes for women and for the future of the Irish nation and then for us to, to be now acting on what happened a hundred years ago and so it's been wonderful work it's about a 25 minute work which we're recording recording shortly so it'll be released in June um, and yeah I've just been trying to develop my practice and work with a number of different artists and composers over the time I'm commissioning Siobhan Cleary is writing a piece for me for later on this year for uh, myself and electronics um, yeah yeah so you've been you've been keeping busy um, yeah which is which is the main thing at the moment isn't it creating our 
own routine and keeping busy. And uh, I was interested to hear you uh, mention that uh, one of the pieces is uh, focusing on Rosie Hackett, Grania, because uh, for those of us that live in Dublin, of course, the most recent bridge that was built across yeah. the Liffey, uh, was it maybe five, six, ten years ago now, yeah. perhaps? Time, time just flies. But of the 22 bridges across the Liffey, I think uh, 21, 22 bridges across the Liffey, it is the only bridge that is named after a woman. So uh, I'm uh, really uh, delighted to hear that uh, she's also included uh, in this new work. And uh, we look forward to that release on the Metier label. But for now, let's hear three movements from Gronje Mulvey's A Carlo Song Cycle for soprano and guitar, based on poetry by Derek Coyle and performed here by Elizabeth Hilliard soprano and Anselm MacDonald guitar. Movement one, Carlo poem, hashtag 17. Movement three, the charred boots. And movement six, Carlo poem, hashtag 43. And the opening movement of this work contains some strong language. <laughs> The sea decided to go on strike It had finally had enough I'm utterly pissed Off with all your human balderdash It said in a tone of beyond diluted Just like 
like my mom.
The three movements from Gronio Mulvey's A Carlo Song Cycle for Soprano and Guitar and performed this evening for us by Elizabeth Hilliard Soprano and Anselm MacDonald Guitar. And as we heard earlier, Anselm and Liz overcoming all the challenges of remote recording for those three movements from Gronio's A Carlo Song Cycle, especially for this very special salon on the Feast of St. Bridget, the first day of spring and celebrating the first day of spring here in Ireland. And I would like to come back to you, Kathleen, as we uh, talk about our final work for this evening, because yes, it is the first day of spring and uh, some snowdrops are popping through and uh, a few daffodils as well, hopefully on the way. And uh, as we say here in Ireland, there is a grand stretch in the evenings uh, compared to uh, a month ago. And so another new work uh, to celebrate uh, the first day of spring. And as we look into to a new year 2021 and this work from Petra Zazi and she's called it Oak and uh, it references the uh, story of St Bridget and her church and her founding of her church uh, close to a great oak tree and uh, Kathleen you're, you've also been collaborating with Petra like you, like you did with Anya on the creation of this new work. 
Yes, we we had a few few chats. Um, it was it was uh, I suppose less uh, an interactive collaboration as as with Anya, but we 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 mainly concentrated. So Petra originally is a guitarist, so she 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 knows the instrument well, but of course she didn't know anything about the new instrument. Actually, she didn't expect it until I showed her that it will be quite a different idiom to write for. Um, and uh, we mainly concentrated on 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 this. Um, that how this new instrument works. Um, I think it's really interesting that somehow both commissions brought in in the nature in 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 the topic. Uh, of course, with the spring and Saint Bridget Day, and uh, uh, I know that Petra right now is staying in a small village in the mountains in Hungary, so um, between woods and nature. So I'm sure that. Uh, the, this gave her some inspiration too. Actually, I never met her uh, live, although we are both Hungarians. Um, I got to know her through the Bloomsday project, um, which is our project coming up in June, yes. um, because she she sent uh, excellent guitar work there. And then that is the reason that I decided to commission her for this project. And um, um, recording the piece was really challenging um, um, because uh, she, she used the new capo system very, very extensively. So you, you'll see in the recording that, uh, that I have to change positions of capos while playing fast passages. Um, I think um, for me, I, I'm really grateful to to you, Yvonne, to 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 make this possible. So actually, not only receiving these new works, excellent works, but also that I could really try out the capacities through new music of my new guitar. Um, yeah, well, it's exciting for us to hear this new instrument, Kathleen. Um, wonderful and how appropriate, um, you know, that uh, on the first day of spring, we get to hear new music and a new instrument. Let's hear from Petra now. She's going to tell us a little bit uh, about uh, her thoughts behind the creation of this work. Hi, my name is Petra Sassi and I'm living in Budapest and uh, I'm currently studying composition in Francis Academy of Music. I like to compose guitar pieces because when I was younger I was a guitarist and that was a very unique part in my life. So I really enjoyed the process of composing this piece for Katalin Koltai. Uh, the piece entitled Oak. It's named after the Church of the Oak. And while I was writing this piece I asked myself a question that what happens exactly with saints while they are praying? and uh, why saints are usually portrayed as simple people and why we think of them as being so quiet and calm. Here we have Saint Brigida who did all these miracles just because she loved God so much. And I think for someone who can love someone this much, the emotions must be much louder and much more extreme. I felt the traditional depiction of saints um, as pious individuals has grown stale. That's why I propose this piece like an alternative uh, plea to deal with the really loud and the exciting word of saints as much as we deal with the silent prayer that's uh, clearly visible on the surface. My compositional technique was rather simple by taking a six note unit uh, of three pitches and placing it into different contexts and I assigned different rhythm patterns to them and contrast these with different more aggressive, more direct musical material to, to see how they can fight each other.
Petra Sassi's Oak, performed by Kathleen Coltai on her new guitar and written especially for this, the Feast of St. Bridget and Embulk, celebrating the first day of spring here in Ireland. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for the performance of that work. It's been such a joy and pleasure to speak with you all this evening, Gronya, Anya, Kathleen, Anselm and Liz, and to share with you this evening uh, in the celebration of the first day of spring, the feast day of St. Bridget. And uh, I'm going to hand back to the ambassador, Ronan Gargan, the ambassador to Hungary. And uh, it's been a great pleasure for us to work with the ambassador and his team on tonight's events. And uh, the ambassador will tell us all about our spotlight event that is coming up just after the salon. Of course, there'll be lots more salons right throughout the spring here on CMC and all the details will be on our website and through social media. Thanks for joining us and stay with us for the CMC Spotlight. On this Feast of St. Bridget, our celebration of the creativity of women continues with the Spotlight on Women in Music hosted by CMC's Linda O'Shea Farron. Again, it gives me great pleasure to pass the bottom to Linda, who is joined by a great panel of women active in music in Ireland and in Hungary to explore aspects of the vibrant music scenes in both countries for the next 45 minutes. Good evening. After a long, dark winter, St. Bridget's Day celebrates the early signs of spring and with this, the creativity and talent of women. I think it's fair to say that in 2021, more than a year in recent history, we are all looking forward to the green shoots of spring and the promise of longer, warmer days ahead. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about women in music, to composers, performers and conductors who are at the top of their art forms and professions in Ireland, Hungary and beyond. Sadly, but inevitably, we will also be talking about barriers that women still face, barriers they have to come all along the way in order to make their enormous contributions to the arts and generally. Let me introduce you to guitarist Kathleen Coltai, composer-performer Jennifer Walsh, soprano Elizabeth Hilliard, composer-conductor Ilona dobsai Meshko, and conductor Sinead Hayes. Kathleen, alongside a very busy career as a professional guitarist, you are currently pursuing PhD studies in the UK while keeping him up with the family spread between Hungary and the UK. Can you tell us how your PhD studies relate to your work as a guitarist and why you chose to move to the UK for these studies? Thank you, Linda. Um, yes, I moved to England um, one and a half year ago. Actually, it was a childhood dream to spend some time or, or move to England. So I'm really glad that we are here now. Um, and uh, my PhD research is very much um, based on my, on my practical work as a, as a musician. So it's a practice-based research. Um, it is interesting that um, first I was joining another PhD uh, of no Noemi Győri, a Hungarian flutist at the Royal Academy of Music as a collaborator. And then I realized that actually my whole work can be theorized as a PhD research in itself. Um, so this was the beginning and uh, I, am, I am working, I'm focused on, on expanding the guitar's idiom, the boundaries of the idiom, through innovation, this, this includes um, inventing a new guitar prototype and some, some extra tools, a transcription and a collaboration with composers. Wow, so you're adding a new instrument, basically a new guitar to the world of contemporary music. Yes, as, as I, actually I, I, I even showed it in the salon. So, and also the, new, the, the two new pieces which I performed in this St. Bridget's event are both composed for this new guitar prototype. So this guitar prototype doesn't have a name yet. It, uh, it is a testing model now, which I am performing on. It, it includes a transform fretboard and it is radically expands the idiomatic borders of the instrument. And um, 
And um, I call call the whole whole now pilot project uh, the Ligeti guitar project because it's actually the idea came from George Ligeti's the Hungarian composer George Ligeti's Musica Ricercata, where he was working with pitch sets, and um, I tried to create something similar on the guitar with with um, special capos. So. Um, so today, actually, you are hearing the very first two works for this new guitar prototype with the magnet cable system. And the name will come when the concert model is ready. I will make a call in social media to ask people what would be the best name for this new guitar. Well, CMC will be happy to put that out on our social media and hopefully we'll get lots of, lots of suggestions. So Jenny, you have the unique distinction of being an elected member of both the Academy der Kunst in Germany, which is Germany's Academy of Arts, and Ireland's equivalent, which is Estona. Now, this is obviously after decades of very hard work, but a fantastic achievement on your part. Can you just tell me, was there any turning point in your career when you felt that you were really getting there or the pieces of the jigsaw, if you like, were coming together? Or has it just been, you know, was there any point that you could Sorry, I was muted. Um, thanks, Linda. That's a that's a that's a difficult question to to answer because I think, like everybody, you just keep working. Um, there certainly are projects where you feel like it was a project that got more exposure, um, or got more press, or you toured it more, or something like that. Um, but uh, I think that these, you know, the Academy der Künste and the Estona elections. They were both things that came out of the blue. I didn't know that they were coming my way. I was very honored uh, when they when they came my, my way. Um, but it's impossible to predict when when those things can happen within the span of your career. Um, and the most important thing is just to keep making the projects um, and, and keep moving forward with the project. So it's 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 a difficult one to judge. Um, I think most composers know there's certain projects which which I'm going to make a terrible pun now. They strike a chord, or they just sort of resonate. Oh, that's a, an even worse one. Uh, but they they just sort of somehow seem to gain their own momentum. Um, and but but again, some of those are very unpredictable. You might do an opera, and you know you pour your entire life into it for you know ten months or a year, and it's it's done it's done for its run, and it goes very well. And but it, it's never seen again. But at the same time, somebody might come up to you and say, oh, I saw a really bad performance of a great piece of yours, you know, in a venue over a pub 10 years ago and it changed my life. So it's impossible. It's impossible exactly to, to know. It, it certainly is. But that's what I was trying to get at. Was there any seminal moment where you felt I'm really getting there now? But as you say, sometimes you feel as an artist you're getting there, but it hasn't actually caught on maybe to audiences yet. So it, they're two different two sides of the same coin. I, I, I think so. I mean, certainly there's moments of pr pride when you think I can pay all my bills, you, you know, like that's a seminal, that's probably the most seminal moment is when you're like, yay, I can pay all my bills. But I think the, the other thing too, and, and maybe this also taps a little bit into the, the theme of, of, you know, getting uh, women together to talk about music on St. Bridget's Day is I certainly feel like one early work that I did, which was a work, um, work uh, an opera for barbie dolls called triple x live nude girls and that was premiered in 2003 and then it was very interesting for me um it would have been about 2016 the piece began being performed again and again and all of a sudden the piece had this new life we, we had sort of toured it a lot between 2003 right up to around 2009, around that period. I was really happy. The piece was played a lot. It was released on DVD. And then I just was moving on. But then sort of um, the sort of millennial generation picked up on the piece. Um, and particularly in the wake of Me Too, uh, the piece had this new life breathed into it. So I could never have predicted that would happen. You know, and it was, it was, uh, it was quite an experience when it did happen. So I think that's, I, I hope to be that sort of composer that you just don't know, you don't know who will resonate with and when. You're just writing for the project. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of the art form, really, that you can go where you want to go and then hopefully people will follow you. And it may be 
with the gap. But you have touched on something there when you talk about subsequent performances, because, of course, in the world of contemporary music, there's a huge emphasis on the world premiere. And then the real point is, are we going to have subsequent performances? So that brings me neatly to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you were a member of Chamber Choir Ireland, which, of course, commissions lots and lots of new works and premieres them. And you also conducted many you know, amateur choirs along the way yourself with your own experience until late 2019 when you decided to pursue a solo career. Now, of course, you didn't know at that time that COVID-19 was around the corner. Um, and what prompted you to take that bold step, Elizabeth? Um, well, really, there were two steps. In 2016, um, in March, I made the decision that I was going to stop um, teaching. I, I had a split career at that point, which was really uh, between my amateur choirs, between um, teaching. I had about 30 piano and voice students at the time and also performing with Chamber Choir Ireland and some solo work. And I, I said, I really built up a lot of the solo work and um, I just completed a residency in Dunleary Rathdown performing a brand new opera by Gronia Mulvey, 45 minutes long for voice and electronics, uh, which was amazing to, to have that opportunity in Dunleary in their lexicon to work on, on this piece and to perform was wonderful. I thought I want more of this in my life. I also that summer was about to um, just linking back to, to Jennifer Walsh. I had contacted her in August of 2015. I said, I'd love to perform all of your music for unaccompanied vocal ensemble with my ensemble ensemble uh, that from my company Bell that I run with David Bremner and she said oh my god that'd be amazing she it had never been performed in Ireland before so we put this festival on in July of 2016 so in March 2016 I knew I had these things coming up and that's what I wanted to focus on so at that point I started stopped teaching and it was a big, a big change because it meant, I mean, I think I lost 16,000 euro um, going forward. I just said, you know, I'm going to, I'll, I'll find other work. I had some work lined up and I'd saved some money. Um, and I found that I, because I made that decision, lots more things came in. People said, oh, she's not doing the teaching anymore. And they said, oh, well, are you free for doing that? And I was able to, to, to take work that previously I wasn't free for. So then in 2019, I was just thinking, I want um, what I'm doing with my life to match in with wh what, I, what I want. So I want to be doing things that I feel I'm really, really good at doing. I want to do work that I really, really enjoy doing. And I want to, you know, to make my life make sense for me. And I was absolutely loved being member of Chamber Choir Ireland. I was a member there for maybe 15 years. I learned a lot of music. I learned a lot about music. I met a lot of really, really interesting people. But I felt for me to kind of continue on into this solo career, um, into pr conducting professionally, I had just, um, in October 2019, I conducted the members of Tunta Ensemble and we, um, we put on a Dublin version of Stockhausen's Stimmel. So I felt this was the time to move on. And as you say, Linda, 2020 didn't, uh, it didn't happen the way I, I planned it. I had some really nice tours planned and I had, um, you know, my debut at the Great Music in Irish Houses. All of these things got postponed. But it, um, what I did learn in, in 2020 was I made the right choice. At no moment was I thinking, God, I wish I just had that security of the, the Chamber Choir Ireland contract. And, and I just said, no, this is the right path for me. I'm absolutely moving on the right path. And there's opportunities coming up all the time. I mean, there certainly are, Elizabeth. You're very central to the work we do here in CMC and to many of our composers. And it's wonderful to see people taking their own careers by the neck, if you like, and to hell with what's going on with, you know, pandemics or whatever. <laughs> As Jenny said, go for it. And if you can pay the bills, hallelujah. And Ilona, this is another woman who has taken her own career by the neck and ha combines being both a composer and a conductor. Now, uh, they're both separately very busy careers, Alona. So can you tell us, you know, what made you decide to go down both those paths together? Um, uh, why should it be surprising for a woman to be a conductor? Let me say a few words about my own story. I could only enter the Liszt Ferenc Academy of Music 
to study conducting because an old professor who insisted that women were not allowed finally retired. So to avoid misunderstandings, uh, if there are too few female conductors in Hungary, it's not because there were too few determined girls with masculine qualities. And yes, why should they need them? But because the quota for women in the last millennium was zero. How I embarked on my career as a composer is a different story. I've been composing music since I was a little girl. At the beginning, it was my grandfather who wrote it down. Then from the age of eight, I've been able to write down the music for myself. It was clear that I was going to be a composer. This creative career is truly suitable for the interval melancholic part of my personality. But a duality is a basic trait of my nature. The stage and the performing arts turned out to be just an importance for me. These two fields make up different periods in my life. After my children were born, and now during the pandemic, if it's of course the composing work that means the contact with art for me. The busy, busy rehearsal periods uh, that precede an orchestral concert aren't suitable for concentrated creation. So they basically the two sides satisfy different desires for you in your career and you've been juggling the two of them all along. Yeah. Well, that brings me to Sinead Hayes, who's a conductor of hard rain soloist ensemble here, a major contemporary music ensemble here on the island of Ireland. And Sinead came to conducting through structural engineering, which is obviously a rather different route. Um, and Sinead, Sinead, can you walk us briefly through the steps from sort of hard hat to baton? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Linda. It's lovely to be here with uh, this amazing group of women. I have to say it's it's fantastic. And listening to your story, Alona, I can't believe that one person stood in the way of women conductors in Hungary. That's an unbelievable statistic. Um, I was lucky uh, in many ways because I suppose I had I had done music as a child. I had, you know, studied in the Royal Irish Academy on, on a scholarship, come up through the ranks, but not had I had never really seen a future as a professional musician, certainly coming from the west of Ireland, there was no real role models. Um, so I decided to do engineering, uh, did my degree in uh, civil engineering at NUIG and then uh, got a scholarship to study uh, structural steel design at Imperial College in London. Um, and when I got to London, it was like the whole world opened up to me and I was playing in orchestras every night on the violin. It was amazing. And I started to look at the conductors and I started to think, I think I could do that. And so I found uh, an evening course in conducting and I stood in front of an orchestra. I was 27 and I remember it distinctly. It was an, a beautiful sunny afternoon. The sun was shining. The choirs, the celestial choirs were, were singing overhead and a switch flicked and I had found something, something connected. So um, from then on, I just kind of made it my mission to, uh, to transition into conducting. I left my engineering job, went back did my music degree in City University, had three amazing years of violin uh, lessons in Guildhall with this amazing teacher called Gerhard Smith, who used to play in the Vienna Philharmonic. And uh, so when I hadn't practiced, my, my questions were about all the amazing conductors he had played for in the, in the Vienna Philharmonic. So it was, it was fantastic. And then I won a place in the uh, Masters in the Royal Northern uh, College of Music in Manchester, the Masters in Conducting. And yeah, I did my last bit of engineering in the summer of 2008 and I saved enough money to get me through the whole year in the Royal Northern. And from then on, I worked as a professional conductor. So I've been very, very lucky, uh, you know, going back to your story, Alona, if if someone hadn't given me the opportunity to study, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. There's no question um, with all the enthusiasm in the world. You need the training you need you need to learn how to do it <laughs> and so I was very very lucky in in the teachers I had and I was always kind of veering towards you know contemporary music and always I suppose that the engineering brain was kind of really useful um giving you a toolkit to kind of uh you know solve all the problems but there was that musical that artistic side that had been slightly suppressed I think by the by the engineering that that came out and it's uh so it's amazing to explore the two sides a little bit like yourself the, t the t kind of duality of the whole thing is um is, re is really important. So it's 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 just been it's been amazing, and I, and I just feel so lucky. Uh, going back to what Jenny said about paying the bills, to be able to pay the bills with music, it's it is a privilege. 
and uh, even if that it is yeah boils down all this creativity and talent in women and you know my own background is as a lawyer and been a lawyer my whole career before entering contemporary music so a similar unusual route uh but um it's the same thing you know in the legal profession uh it's a very male dominated profession still despite the fact of the number of women who practice all the partners are men so um jenny i'm going to get into a little bit of your career because clearly we have an overview now of everybody but Jenny one of the things that you know you're particularly well known for is that you are an integral part of the performances of many not all obviously but many of your own works and was there anything in particular that prompted you to do this or was that just a natural progression or is that just how you do your own work? Um, I think it's it's interesting to me that it's considered notable within new music when um, the composer is involved in the performances. Um, because the history of certainly Western classical music um, has a lot of composers heavily involved in disseminating the work, um, you know, especially like in early periods or like the Baroque, the, the composer was often playing the work or directing the, the rehearsals. But, you know, and, and certainly in Ireland, in trad and in folk, of course, you would be you would be involved in performances. Um, and as somebody who's like a lifelong pop music fan, you know, it's not notable that Prince plays his own music, you know, as well as writes songs for other people. Um, it's just a more and I suppose for me, it's just a vision of musicianship where um, you're doing all the different things. So when Sinead is talking about taking violin lessons as well as being the conductor, um, you know, I spent a lot of formative years playing in the Irish Youth Orchestra, which uh, gave me the best orchestration lessons that I could hope for, you know, I said because I was a trumpet player, so I sat at the back and could see everything that was happening. Um, so I certainly think that's just a, a normal way of functioning. Um, and it, to me, it's it's very life giving, if, if that makes sense, in that um, I get together with other people and we play music. I do a lot of free improvisation as well. And if you're doing that regularly, you're learning about sound all the time, how it behaves in space, how you describe it to people, how you shape it. So um, I that that's just sort of part of how part of how I function, I suppose. Well, I agree with you 100%, Jenny. And it's, it's the reason I'm asking the question is that it has kind of struck me as strange since I've come into this role because, mm -hmm. um, you know, the legal profession is split into solicitors and barristers and they have different jobs to do. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, certainly with contemporary music, I know that, you know, composers like Rachmaninoff often composed for his own actual fingers and he had huge hands and it was mm -hmm. hard for people to play the works mm -hmm. he composed because he actually composed for his own 10 fingers. And um, it, it has struck me and I wondered whether it was the kind of professionalization of performance that in order now to be able to call yourself, you know, a soprano or a guitarist or whatever, you have to nearly have the PhD in it. And then you have to have the PhD in composition and you have to have PhD in musicality and you have to, in musicology rather. Mm -hmm. And has it split up the profession of composition and taking the composer out of his or her own work? Well, um, I, I, my sort of read on it is that it's a specifically Western art music um, phenomenon, because if you look at folk musics, you don't split people up like that. You, you don't say you, you would never have a folk music school where you said, well, these people sit in a room alone and write the tunes. You, you know, and these other people sit in a in a pub alone and play the tunes on the squeeze box. Like that's ludicrous that you would split those things. And I think um, it's something that's a specific phenomenon. It's embedded institutionally in all of the educational systems. Um, it's it's embedded in the way that degrees are organized. So it's difficult often for performers who are interested in composing to actually get access to composition lessons because of how their degrees are structured. And um, there's hierarchy. Um, having having friends who are both solicitors and barristers, I, I understand the hierarchical uh, hierarchical nature and the, the views of, of some of them. And I think that it's, I, I sort of, I don't teach like that. My sort of, I, I teach, I teach um, in a way that my sort of attitude is anybody is a performer and anybody's a composer, just make the stuff and perform it. Um, so I, I do think that it's something which I'm curious what conservatoires 10, 20, 50 years from now will look like, um, because they're really 
sort of a lot of them are very much encased in amber and the music that's taught and the music that's programmed and the music that the students play for their exams is the same as it was 30 to 50 years ago. And I'm curious about how, I, I think that's one of the sites that we can make real institutional change. And those of us who have or are privileged enough to have jobs within those sort of structures can try and make change. Because when I go and I see that the brass department are playing the exact same repertoire that, you know, my, my fellow brass students played 25 years ago with no thought over the fact that every piece is written usually by a Caucasian, uh, a Caucasian deceased uh, male. Um, th then you think like this is completely out of step with what is happening in art schools. It's completely out of step with what's happening in society. So I think those structures, we have to think about ways to change them. I think we do, certainly. And certainly contemporary music is, is, is chomping at the bit to tell the rest of the world about that. And Ilona, I know that, you know, when you talked about, obviously, you know, difficulties in becoming a conductor, um, I suppose you were really touching on the concept of social construct, you know, where a uh, concept is not naturally occurring, but rather it's given meaning by humans and is then accepted as fact. And I'm just wondering whether um, you, can expand on that in terms of your work as a composer as well. Have you had these difficulties of social construct as a composer as well as as a conductor? Now first, um, today there is no need for a woman to bring 10 children into this world to have two who reach adulthood and come back from the war, yeah? <laughs> it's clear that back in history, women were or had to be held back for this purpose. But these days, apart possibly for a few years break when they have small children, women can have about 40 years left to do what they are good at. Then concerning physical strength, in our mechanized world, men's physical strength is not a priority need anymore. In any event, being a nurse working night shifts is physically draining, but this is a socially acceptable as a job for women alongside raising children. Whereas owning your own business is feminism. And why is that? Uh, only in the past hundred years or so, women have been allowed to pursue careers in medicine as well as nursing, which is the same grueling hospital environment. Were women less capable 100 years ago? Likewise, being a cleaning lady is physically draining, but again, this is socially acceptable as a job for women alongside raising children. Whereas being on stage is feminism and about the choice of creative careers. I think concerning our occupation, we are most worthy in our human existence if we all give the world what we are most talented at and happiest doing. So why should it be a trade of between our chosen profession and family life, especially if the trade off is only for women? In my experience, both as a composer and a conductor, if a woman has a creative career, she often needs to give explanations. Women in creative careers are often said to be seeking self-fulfillment, said so with a critical undertone, just because they, their entire being, is involved in their work. On the other hand, Working hard day and night for little money while taking care of the family is a socially accepted ordinary life for a woman. Interesting that we have to have this conversation in 2021, but it is uh, permeates society. Kathleen, you have chosen uh, guitar as your instrument. And uh, um, let's say, in terms of composition here in Ireland anyway, a lot of the composers for guitar are men and they often perform their own works. And I know we try to, so events like this to highlight these instruments and bring women into them. I know Jenny played the trumpet when she was younger and that's another sort of instrument that often is played by men. Um, have you found any difficulties in sort of navigating your career in that, in guitar, professional guitar? 
Well, I, I think um, there is a stereotype of, of the guitar as being a masculine instrument somewhere. It's, I would say it's global view. Although the guitars um, um, in theme and, um, and um, introverted and very sensitive nature doesn't explain that at all. But, uh, but still, there is an opinion, a very strong opinion of expecting guitarists to be men. Um, and um, in, in my home, homeland, Hungary, I, I, I cannot deny that I, I did struggle with this whole concept. Um, as a guitarist, my 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 um, experience is actually that it really differs in different kind of groups. So there are musical groups which are more open and not bringing any gender issues in Eastern Europe, where there are other groups who are bringing. So I have very good and very bad experiments to experiences too in in my home country. Um, I think it very much depends on on the opinion leaders of certain um, groups. So in case of Hungarian guitar community, all the opinion leaders are men and the way they, they formed the mainstream um, is that it is not very much accepting women um, on stage, uh, accepting, although accepting women guitarists being teachers, but not as performers. So um, nevertheless, I know many, many excellent, super talented Hungarian women guitarists. Most of them are unfortunately not on stage and were, were forced to go on a teaching career only. Um, and I have very different experiences here in England or Ireland or the United States. Um, I, I think this, these concepts are more or mostly belonging to the past, really, or like in, in the mainstream dialogue, I am not meeting any of these, these uh, discriminative concepts. That's good news. Uh, but it does bring me to another area, which is, you know, the choral. And it's interesting, I always notice that uh, a lot of choral conductors are women, certainly in Ireland, that may not be the case internationally, but um, it's almost universally the case. Uh, but then when it comes to conducting um, orchestras, that's less so the case. Um, it's also less so the case when you have adjudication panels for choral competitions. So, um, you know, maybe Elizabeth, you could talk a little bit like that, about that, about sort of your experience of the choral world versus the orchestral world. Yes, um, so I started off as an orchestral musician that was going to be my path. Um, and I don't believe I was ever conducted by a female conductor. Um, as an orchestral musician. I also, similar to Jenny, I, I played in the Irish Youth Orchestra, which was amazing. Um, I feel I sang in Chamber Choir Ireland from 2004 until 2019 as, as a full-time member. Um, and in that time, while you, you speak about how most condu choral conductors are female, in that time, the artistic director, we, um, there was time and there was also a previous artistic director and all three were men. Um, I believe we were conducted, uh, I mean, there must have been so many guest conductors. I must have worked with maybe 30 guest conductors over that time, possibly more. And I think three are female. So we worked with um, Orla Flanagan. We worked with Odeline de Martinez. I, I hope that's her name. And also the new conductor of the BBC Singers, uh, um, the new artistic director, Sophie. I'm really, uh, really apologize, so so Sophie, I cannot remember your surname, but perhaps uh, it can go uh, later on. Um, 
And I feel that 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 is more of a strange thing when you say that there's so many female conductors working working in Ireland, working abroad uh, in in the choral field, that yes, they're still to make their mark in in the professional um, arena. Yes, so Sinead, you obviously Um, are making your mark in the professional arena as a conductor. And I'm just wondering, as an experience, person, as an experience for you, do you ever have to take your hard hat out and as a conductor as well? <laughs> Damn it. Um, well, I think a hard head definitely is probably a quite quite a useful thing for a conductor to have. But yeah, it's it's interesting. You know what what Catalin was saying and and what what Liz was saying. You know, the opinion makers are men, and the gatekeepers are men. And and if you look at you know how 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 guest conductors and how conductors are actually invited. It's a, it's a process. It comes from the top. Uh, a name is put forward. You check the availability. But if that name is not a female conductor or if, if those names are not diverse, then those people never get invited and you don't, you don't get the opportunities. Now, I was very, very lucky. I remember I did a, an audition with the RT Concert Orchestra in 20, it was 2012, and that was just after me sending in a, a CV. And that's how I got started, uh, really, really in Ireland. It was just me sending a CV and one person deciding, yes, we'll, we'll give her a chance to audition. But I, I, I wonder how many other people didn't get that chance and who don't get that chance on a continual basis. So it's, it's really about the gatekeepers. It's really about, you know, encouraging diversity and making sure that people get a chance. And, you know, conducting is one of these things that takes time and you might not be where you where you want to be when you start out, but five years later, you might be in a completely different place. But if the if the opinion has been decided, well, no, we don't want to see her again. That's not fair. It's like we don't get the instrument until <laughs> we get the instrument in front of us. So you can't you can't learn your craft without the experience. And it's chicken and egg thing. If you're not getting the experience, you're not going to progress. It's just that simple. And I'm incredibly lucky with Hard Rain that, you know, I get to work with this world class and they are they are a world class group of, of contemporary musicians who are just amazing. And we have a way of working that is, you know, artistically, musically, technically, really, really fulfilling and really, really amazing. But I just think in Ireland, we do need a bit of a shake up in terms of the diversity of conductors we're seeing on our podiums. That's and that's what I would that's say. Very important uh, for composers as well to know that, let's say you're a woman conductor, you're a conductor, you happen to be a woman. Um, do you think that that makes any difference in terms of your choice of works that are composed by women or men? Are you more conscious? Are you gender blind? Uh, and more importantly, when it comes to conducting large scale works by women. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I try to be gender blind. I'll, I'll try to be gender biased when I'm when I'm picking a work. And if, if it's quality, I mean, it's it's all about quality. It has to be technically, you know, able to go. You can't be wasted. Yeah. That's yeah. It. We're yeah. talking about lack of quality. We were talking yeah. about with that obvious, you know, assumption. Yeah, I, I do try. I do try. I mean, it's um, it's it's just it's really difficult to find things that you know will work for a program. So if you're programming something, it's really difficult to bring a thirty minute work by a contemporary composer to an orchestra the first time you go. What you want is a seven minute work that fits in with smaller orchestral forces that doesn't need you to hire five extra percussionists and you know two pianos and five five harps. What you want is something that's easy to program. It's easy to sell to an orchestra. And I had this, you know, even with even with the RT concert orchestra, I tried to sell them about three different contemporary pieces to do in a lunchtime concert. And it was it it, it just wouldn't fly because I didn't have a recording. The works were slightly too long. The instrumentation didn't quite match. So it's it's what I would love is I would love to have, you know, 20 pieces that I could say. I know this one works. I know it'll come together in half an hour rehearsal with with an orchestra because you've got to think about rehearsal time and, and you know how is it going to come together. And then you just don't want to just play the notes. You want it to be musically excellent as well as everything else. You have to get beyond just we'll get through it. You know you want you want it to get under the skin of the players. So that's I think that's the biggest. It's about having a body of works available there. Not Absolutely. Just the odd one popping up here and there. Yeah. And um, and that. That's the same in any profession or any walk of life where choices have to be made. The selection has to be there in the first place. Um, So Ilona, in terms of uh, 
people at the helm of festivals, because that's another thing, programming, uh, you know, if the works are there, the canon of works is there, are there, then it comes down to programming. What about heads of festivals or, um, you know, people in management in Hungary? Um, uh, sadly, that's a similar story. Um, if we take a look at the leadership roles in Hungary, we find that the National Theatre in Hungary has never had a female director in the 185 years of its history. The Hungarian State Opera has never had a female director in the 136 years of its history. And let's see the politics. Hungary has only had 15 female ministers until now, ever, altogether. But fortunately, uh, there are some areas where gender equality is at more uh, advanced stage in the cultural scene. Women rank among the managers, agents and directors in festivals and art management. So um, what about you, Elizabeth? What's your ex been your experience of programming in festivals? Um, so I've been involved in a few different festivals. The, um, the first festival that um, I was involved in was my own festival, Vale Festival. We, we ran our first festival in 2010. Um, and we had a meeting with Michael Durbin. Um, you know, we, we were recommended to, to go and meet him. And his one of his first comments was, looking at our press release, um, it's 50-50 male, female. We had a number of people highlighted in bold. Um, and he just said, it's so unusual. And we just looked at him and he said, sure, like, uh, the world is 50-50, male, female, and uh, there's nothing surprising about this. And he's like, no, you should really make it um, a big thing about it. Um, but, well, I mean, we, we decided not to. It was just it was just one of those things that um, we thought was, it was normal. The next festival I was involved in was the Hilltown New Music Festival, uh, which was really, really wonderful. It was run by um, David Stalling and Anthony and um, Kelly and they put together this wonderful array of, of music and it was generally I mean I, I couldn't give you what the gender balance was but there was some really 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 interesting uh, female composers that were were there it was the first time I actually saw Jennifer Walsh perform live there was music by Karen Power and there was some wonderful um and it was a huge array of music it wasn't just having to be um I think Sinead was talking about the gatekeepers where it's decided what the type of music that an audience wants to listen to is. Whereas in the Hilltown Festival, it was just a vast array of sound art, of uh, composed music, inst installations. And it really opened my mind up to the huge uh, amount of possibilities. And uh, more recently, I've been involved with, um, I'm going to be performing on the 8th of March, with the Finding a Voice Festival in Clonmel, which was set up three years ago uh, to feature solely the music of female composers, because I think their mission is that really there has to be a platform for female for female composers or composers, as you say, that happen to be women, and um, because there aren't so many performances of of um, music by composers that are women, and um, and I think that's that's a wonderful festival here here in Dublin here in Ireland. It's in Clonmel. I mean, there's no question about it. We are attempting in a short space of time to tackle a massive topic. Um, and um, nobody's pretending that we're going to get to the heart of it or anything. But it is interesting to just have some, you know, sort of insights from people um, who are like the panel here today, who have such vast experience over such a long period of time. And you mentioned audiences there, uh, Elizabeth. And that's something I wanted to touch on, too, with Kathleen. Because as a performer um, and a soloist, guitarist, and, you know, in the end of the day, Jenny talked about paying the bills and we're all talking about PhDs and um, we, we talked about having families. So uh, what about all, building new and broader audiences for contemporary music? Uh, Kathleen, have you any sort of wild and crazy suggestions what we could do during COVID? Take advantage. Um yeah, well, of course, this is a huge topic, which could <laughs> have a huge panel talk as in itself. But um, um, personally, I really believe in 
dialogue um, as a concept to contemporary music. Um, I, I feel that one of the main concerns uh, when it comes to audience that there is a certain type of alienation uh, of, the, of the genre and, um, and uh, man, many groups of audiences feel that they are disconnected from the whole genre and they are kind of, I don't understand contemporary music um, position because I am like not enough trained, not enough educated, I don't recognize. Uh, so there are all kinds of concerns about education, which is of course brings brings a lot of topics in like elitism, snobbism, niche, uh, um, style and 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 all kind of things which which are which can be called problematic and I don't think we have space here to no, discuss but but in my personal in my personal choice I I am I am aiming for creating a dialogue with the audience so I think if performers composers can show that they are real persons, they have a face, like this talk here, that, uh, that we are here, we, 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 what we feel about it, what our personal opinion about it, how, how does it connect to us, then if we can show this to the audience, and then they can feel better connected to it. So in my, in my, in my career, I, I, I was project leading several several contemporary music series for young people. And I was always trying to engage them to a dialogue in, in diverse forms. Um, um, so that's my, my path. I mean, you're, you're, you're really hit it, the nail on the head there, I think, Kathleen, because I mean, certainly when I was growing up, classical music and opera were considered something you needed to know something about before you could listen to them. Um, you could go into a gallery and look at a painting on a wall and you weren't supposed to have to know anything about it except what your eyes showed you. But somehow your ears had to be better educated for classical music. And Jenny said this earlier on when she was talking about traditional music and how it was a strange thing that um, in contemporary music that it was notable that, um, you know, that composers would be a, an integral part of their own works. So, as you know, Jenny, one of the things that I am always fascinated by your alter ego um, works, you know, like group hat. And has, is that a way for building audiences in a way where it's, it's using the imagination of people? Um, to be honest, with the working with alter egos, for me, it's, I wasn't thinking about building audiences. I was thinking about uh, getting away from the, the sort of the system of strictures within new music. And um, so, I mean, when I did the group app project, I had nine different alter egos from that, um, four men, four women, and one drag queen. And, um, what I found was quite interesting was, um, if I can put it this way, um, you know, Sinead is talking about how, you know, orchestras are trying to figure out how to do programming and they're trying to figure out that there's a lot more that goes on than just is the piece good. There's also, can we rehearse it in half an hour? You know, does it require extra five extra percussionists or something like that? Um, so I was interested in, in, in sort of how some of these decisions are made, what, why people choose one piece or say they like a, a composer over another. And the, like by working with these alter egos, what was fascinating to me was that I would do a concert where I would do you know, four or five pieces ostensibly by five different people. And then people would come up and they'd say things that were vaguely sexist, vaguely racist, you know, about the composers, because they didn't think they were talking about me. They thought they were talking about the composers on the program. And you suddenly realize, oh, there's a whole lot of bias in here. Like there's a reason why, you know, if you work for Microsoft, they make you do implicit bias training because like the entire culture has sort of biased people um, to, to, to sort of at times be sexist, be racist, be transphobic, be homophobic, you know? And so um, with the working with the alter egos, it was a way to sort of play with that um, aesthetically and also socially, because I could write a piece in a very, in an aesthetic, which seemed completely opposed to the next alter egos aesthetic and then people would talk to, about them in a more free way 
Um, the, the other thing too, was that for me, once you saw that you were working under a different name, you realized people treated the, the work in a different way. And so uh, there is one thing I, I would say is that I sort of, in terms of our efforts to move towards more diversity in programming, um, is that I think that we have this fallacy that all of music programming has been based exclusively on quality. You know, so in my lifetime, I've seen a whole lot of terrible music, Do you, you know, so the idea that like all we've ever done is look for the highest quality pieces and program them is total rubbish. Do you know what I mean? A lot of pieces are programmed because of nepotism, because like it's a flute and electronics gig and they need like one five minute piece to fill out the program because the programmer saying, please, it has to go for an hour. You know, like there's a huge amount of reasons why pieces get programmed, which has nothing to do with quality. Um, and so, so I, I think that um, by do with the group out project, it was, it, it, the side, I, I didn't realize how much of a side effect it would be to sort of see these things, uh, you know, or hear these comments from people, but, but it sort of drove those issues home for me in a way that uh, no amount of sociological papers could. Well, that's a perfect wrap for me because I'm really interested in your alter egos and I would just like to uh, say thank you to everybody. In this evening, CMC Salon, CMC and the Embassy of Ireland Hungary are delighted to have featured the world premiere performances of two new pieces of music written specially for this celebration of St. Bridget's Day 2021 by composers Anya Malin from Ireland and Petra Sassi from Hungary, with both works written for and performed by Katalin Koltai. It was also a great joy to hear excerpts from Gronja Malvi's A Carlo Song Cycle performed by soprano Elizabeth Hilliard and guitarist Ansel MacDonald, both of whom had to overcome all of the challenges of recording remotely with great skill and commitment. Thank you also to all the panelists in this evening's CMC Spotlight, sharing their insights and experiences and providing a very stimulating discussion on women in music in Ireland and in Hungary. Thank you, Ilona Dubsai Meshko, Sinead Hayes, Elizabeth Hilliard, Kathleen Kaltai and Jennifer Walsh. And now all that remains for me to do is on behalf of the Contemporary Music Centre here at Handel's Arch where Handel's Messiah was first performed in April 1742 and from the Embassy of Ireland in Budapest to thank you all for attending this event and wish you a happy St. Bridget's Day from all of us. And we look forward to our continued partnership for Bloomsday in June 2021 when Kathleen Kaltai will be leading the way with us again. And thank you all very, very much. <laughs>